kinds of... Uh, you do. Uh, Those I, are your experiences. I do. No, no, you're drawing the pictures, Doctor. <laughs> yes, but you're the one who has all the uh, uh, references uh, because of, of your experience. Mm. And so you're happy to let people make them up as they go along? I insist on it. Oh. Rauschenberg's often unsettling work was a long way from the light-hearted celebration of Americana of British pop art. For most American artists, American popular culture was the enemy, deadening, inescapable, commercial. So when Roy Lichtenstein's first one-man show opened in New York in 1962, it was evident that something new was happening to American art. In the brightly coloured melodramas of comic book fantasy, Lichtenstein found a peculiarly 20th century fascination. Critics scoffed, but a handful of canny buyers recognised what was happening. Before the show even opened, all 15 works had sold. Sun took his pictures to be satire or parody, but as Lichtenstein explained in a BBC interview, his work was based on a real affection and respect for the pulp fiction he was drawing on. It's dealing with the images that have come about in, in the commercial world and it's using that because there are certain things about it which are impressive or uh, bold or something. And it's that uh, quality of the images that I'm interested in. But it's not saying that, that commercial art is terrible or uh, look what we've come to. That, that may be a sociological fact, but that's not what this art is about. Roy Lichtenstein was the son of a wealthy Jewish property developer. Just five years before the one-man show that would make his name, Lichtenstein was a failed artist in his 30s. Uninspired by the abstract expressionism that dominated American art, but struggling to find a style of his own. One night he was reading to his young sons, when something caught his eye in a children's book. Lichtenstein started to draw the cartoon characters he saw. In 1961, he produced a large-scale painting called Look, Mickey. Lichtenstein enlarged the cartoon image onto a huge canvas, using bold primary colours and adding comic book speech bubbles. I think he was drawn to them because they were looked upon as discredited. Nobody thought of comic book art as art, as uh, high art. It turned art on its head. Comic book images used tiny printed dots known as bende dots to give an illusion of depth or light and shade. Lichtenstein faithfully replicated the dots and all the graphic devices of comic book art in his huge canvases, exaggerating the familiar and making it strange. The original cartoon style just seemed to have every element necessary for me. The comic book image, it had all of the mechanical things, the dots, the, the black lines around everything, the more or less primary colors, all of this was just something that ready made to, uh, to symbolize what we were really getting into, a kind of uh, ready made in, in plastic era. He's saying this is the nature of um, culture in the mid 20th century. This is the nature of consumerist culture, of mass media, where things are reproduced ad infinitum. Some kernel of authenticity has been lost, and instead we live in this hall of mirrors all about reproduction, imagery going round and round and round, losing that sense of um, individuality. By taking a single cartoon image and removing it from its original context, Lichtenstein made it somehow mysterious, enticing the viewer to invent their own narrative. I, I think blowing them up does get you to examine them more closely, see how the, you get the idea that it's kind of funny the way the, these things are made. 
that a girl will have really yellow hair and she'll really have red dots on her face and, and blue dots in her eyes or whatever the cliche is. Um, and that we've taken this for real kind of without thinking about it. And, and now we can see how artificial and abstract it really is. By the time this picture was painted, the critics had stopped carping and Liechtenstein was the toast of the art world. Why do we care about Liechtenstein? There's no should, you know, I mean, you don't have to care about Liechtenstein at all. But at a time when high culture was threatened by the mainstream, he actually took what was threatening it and turned it into a strength and reinvigorated art in the process. That's quite a nifty trick to pull off but he did it with great aplomb and style and wit. But the darling of the new American pop art had a rival. He faced competition from a shy, aspiring artist named Andy Warhol. In the 1950s, Andy Warhol was working in New York as an illustrator in advertising. He found his inspiration in the well-stocked aisles of the American supermarket. In 1962, in his first one-man exhibition, Warhol displayed 32 paintings of different varieties of Campbell's soups. Reactions ranged from bewildered amusement to plain bewilderment. A Canadian government spokesman said that your art could not be described as original sculpture. Would you agree with that? Ah, uh, yes. Why uh, do you agree? Well, because it's not original. You have just then copied a common uh, item. Yes. Well, why have you bothered to do that? Why not create something new? Uh, because it's easier to do. And he would always say the worst thing, the worst thing that you had at the back of your mind by re responding in that way, he amused himself. He also took away all the sting and all the attacks that can come in an interview. He, he sort of deadened them. Born to immigrant Slovak parents, the young Andy Warhola was a shy, introverted child. Awkward and often inarticulate, Warhol instinctively grasped the essentials of American popular culture, from its mass-produced objects of desire to its obsession with celebrity and fame. His silkscreen prints of American icons strikingly brought the two together, most famously in his series of images of Elvis and Marilyn Monroe. In some way, by mass producing an image again and again and again and again, you almost drain it of meaning. That the thing that was so special about Marilyn Monroe, the fact that she was unique and uniquely beautiful maybe, becomes defeated by the mass production of the imagery. I want to be a machine, he said, and he called his New York apartment the factory. Here, he gathered around him an entourage of admirers, assistants, and hangers-on, making prints, taking photos, producing films. In 1965, the writer Susan Sontag visited Warhol in his studio for BBC's Monitor programme. Andy! He's got the on warmer. Oh, hi. Is Andy here? <laughs> The camera's already rolling. <laughs> Is he here? No. Oh, Christ. He told me to come today. I know. Yeah. So well, come on in. I brought the BBC with me. Come on in, BBC. Oh, crazy. He's hiding. <laughs> He's camera shy. Is that a lot? <laughs> you mind? I thought maybe you'd like to see the eclair, yes. and they want oh, to I see do. you. Yeah, I really want to see the. And this is. Can uh, I really see the eclair? Yeah, oh, look, it's, it's 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 doing you right oh, now. Oh wow! All right, it's a uh, you know, it's like spontaneous. Oh. Okay. Wow. Can I really see the camera now? Well, you mean while it's uh, watching? Oh yeah, it's just. <laughs> you true. watch it, and it watches you. Oh. <laughs> Can we do a cheese movie? All you have to do is say, cheese, cheese. All right. 
No, the next one, the next three minutes could be a cheese move. All right. What's the spirit of this one? Uh, it's just you don't have to do anything. Just what you're doing. Can I move? Yeah, you can move, but not too much. The most influential artist of the late 20th century is uh, Andy Warhol, because Andy. Uh, uh, addressed all of the issues of the day. He did all the things that an artist might do at the time in a way that nobody else was doing. He loved the movies and he loved stars, so he creates his own cinema. And he has his own stars. In a sense, he recreates the cultural world. A few years later, Warhol was followed by the BBC on a trip to London to promote his latest film. First stop, the Hyde Park home of Britain's premier film critic, Dillis Powell. I know you love the movies. I'm going to ask you if, if you have a favorite film star. It's, a, it's all a question people ask me, and I can't think of anybody. I can't have no, any really names. I like everybody. You like everybody? Yeah, I really do. I've seen up to now Chelsea Girls in a very sort of truncated version, and I really didn't know what was going on. It was so cut. I, you know, and I saw Bike Boy and Flesh, which I really liked very much indeed. Well, what we do is we're just learning how to make movies. No, but you, you do it with real enthusiasm, don't you? It's so nice. Yeah. Yes, all of you, all three of them. Oh, this is yes. fun. Marvelous, yes, marvelous, yes. Warhol said pop was about liking everything. Certainly the art market liked Warhol, and still does. In 2012, his 1963 painting, Double Elvis, sold at auction for $33 million. Not everyone, though, is convinced. Warhol um, is probably my least favourite artist of the 20th century, and I think the, you know it's an argument I've had with many, many uh, kind of nabobs of the contemporary art world is to say to them, "Do you really want to sit in front of an Andy Warhol silkscreen print for an hour or two, uh, as you might?" sit in front of a canvas by Francis Bacon, for example, and just sop it up. Is there enough there to aesthetically interest you for a long period of time? Andy Warhol is a, a brilliant, you know, symbol of America, really, and he managed to do a great thing, which is to be iconic and ironic at the same time in his work, which is a lot of artists can't do that. And I think, you know, he kind of poked the finger at America, pointed, laughed at America, and, you know, he kind of embraced its, its weaknesses and its strengths. <laughs> genius or showman, Warhol brought to a close 20 years of dramatic change in the story of art. Within two decades, you've gone from the very dark existential angst of artists like Bacon responding to the cruelty and barbarity of the Second World War to a much more glamorous and uh, shiny, exciting, bright new art movement known as pop you find this explosion right across the arts of creativity and new modes, new ways of making art, which, when you look back now, I think seems like a real golden age. And whenever I think about the artists who were working in the 60s, they seem completely heroic. What they were doing is still completely scintillating and exhilarating. But a new era of unrest was dawning and a new generation of artists was waiting to redefine the meaning of art itself. Same old way. 